room already, uh, so I'm going to start slowly. Um, people are always welcome to join. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Sarah Ben Mamari. I'm the Associate Director for Research Services at Well Cornell Medicine, which is a medical campus of Cornell University. Uh, we are located in New York City, uh, while our mother university is um, um, located in Ithaca, upstate New York. Um, and today I'm going to talk about this service that we call Data Core, which is our secure computational enclave for the host for hosting and analyzing sensitive data um, 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 at our medical campus. Um, before I start, I just wanted to highlight one thing. So this service would not be possible with, without the contribution of many who have not been able to join us, unfortunately, today. However, there is one person who is here, and I, I want to... Um, uh, highlight, it's uh, Terry um, Willer, who is our uh, library director at Well Cornell Medicine. She's the lady um, with the blue jacket and the blue dress, the blue lady, you cannot miss her. Um, and so she's very knowledgeable also about data core. Don't hesitate to reach out to her if you have any question. All right, so let's start about data core. Let's talk about data core. And before Diving into the technical details, I just wanted to give um, a little bit of context of, about data core and how basically it fits in the whole picture uh, at Well Cornell. So what we use at Well Cornell as a framework is uh, this research data life cycle. You're probably all very familiar with it, but in a nutshell, you start with the planning, designing of an experiment, then comes the time to collect data, to analyze it, then comes the time to manage, store it and preserve it, share it and publish it, and um, it ends with the discovery um, and the reuse and the citation of those data sets. And Data Core um, really intervenes in this piece uh, where um, it's about collaboration and analysis, data analysis. But I want to highlight that Data Core is a service that connects with multiple other services that we offer at Well Cornell. Um, the others are, for example, the Scientific Software Hub that we use as a platform to provide um, scientific software to our um, faculty or our researchers and students. Um, it also connects very much with our data retention tool that we designed recently to help re uh, our researchers um, comply with the latest re regulation uh, from NIH regarding data management and sharing. And it also connects very much to our data catalog that um, we built to foster discovery and reuse of data sets. Um, all these um, services, they um, really are aiming to achieve three main goals. The first one is to really build a data management uh, program, research data management uh, program to help our researchers throughout the research data life cycle and facilitate their, their, um, their work. The second objective is to engage our stakeholders and also foster um, the use of fair principles, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. And um, the third objective is to also provide um, storage solutions for researchers, especially when they uh, reach the end of the research data life cycle. And I just wanted to take like a few minutes also, or actually a few seconds to uh, share about what the library do does um, at Well Cornell. So librarian, they just don't uh, manage data core only, they curate data, they administer and run the data core service. They also um, run the scientific software hub service. Uh, we uh, manage and develop our data catalog uh, and run it. Um, same for our data retention tool that we started in July 2022. We also, of course, support our, facu our faculty or researchers uh, with their data management and sharing plan, anything that relates to data repository, picking a good repo for their data set. And we also work very closely with our research integrity office to help with any matters that relates to uh, data integrity. And here on the right side, you can see um, this, um, you can see like this um, diagram that really shows how all our services connect with each other. Data core is here, but it really connects very much with our data catalog, our long-term repository, um, in our scientific software hub. So now some history about data core. How did it all start? Data core was born from an institutional demand for a secure enclave that, um, that was really um, coming from all our researchers, but particularly from one of our biggest and most important department at Well Cornell, which is the PHS department, stands for Population Health Sciences. Those people, they are doing a lot of computational work. They deal with massive data sets. Um, and only sensitive data set. They get most of their data set from the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. So they really had a need for a computational power storage, but also like a space that is secure to host and analyze their data set. So we started building what we call now Data Core, 
at the beginning it was for a few users per project. Now we have up to projects that have up to one users, up to, sorry, from one users to multiple users, up to 31 users, um, and uh, even up to entire classrooms as well. Um, and it is really built to favor collaboration. So now people inside our institution, but also outside, can perfectly use Data Core. Um, there is absolutely no issue. And um, it all started with the department subsidy. That means uh, the PHS department actually was subsidizing at the beginning of uh, the service. But since it's been um, blooming and really is used really wide across different departments right now, we are moving to a chargeback model to our researchers based on their projects. So it, we don't get the subsidy anymore. So what we want about Data Core is really to be a secure space, a secure environment. And this diagram here is really to illustrate the different layers of security that we have within Data Core. Data Core is really an enclave. So when a researcher connects to Data Core, all what they see is their data and the scientific software that they need to do their analysis. Um, if you are an internal user, you have to be part of that WCM network. So uh, in order to connect to Data Core, if you are outside the institution, you have to um, use our remote apps. I mean, in both cases, you have to use our remote apps to connect to our Data Core enclave. And these remote, app, these remote apps uh, make sure that you use dual authentication, WCM credential. If you don't have any, we provide you some. Um, and um, that you're connected to the VPN to access uh, the enclave. Another important thing is that the Data Core curation team really takes care, are really the intermediary and the data custodian for um, 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 users of Data Core. So users never, like PI, never handle the data set by themselves. The data provider directly gives us the data. We make sure that they are put in the Data Core. And any import or export of data set is ensured through the data curation team, which is made mostly of librarians, in fact. And any transfer of data set between the PI and the data core creation team happens through secure WSFTP. So I give you also here a little bit um, some numbers about uh, current numbers about data core. We have a lot of projects. Um, currently, we have 83 current projects and about 300 users. 62 PIs are using the service. And over time, we had about over uh, almost 200 projects. Um, over 600 users have been using data core and um, 82 PIs as of now. So it is really trusted in mature services of now, so much that our um, IRB and the New York Presbyterian Hospital, which is part of the Web Cornell Medicine uh, family, is um, uh, encouraging people to use Data Core to host electronic uh, PHI data sets or any medical records, pretty much. So this has been published a while ago already, in 2018. Um, it is an old paper, but check it out because it really shows um, the principle governing operation and management of data core, especially regarding data uh, governance. Oh, I forgot to mention that any project in data core has to have data governance document associated to it, either a DUA, data use agreement, or RB protocol, or both. What we want also data core to be is really a collaborative tool. And um, this has been illustrated by uh, three big um, 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 uh, projects that have been hosted through uh, Data Core. One of them is the New York Insight Clinical Research Network um, during, that happened during COVID. So this has been a project that has been used by multiple New York, um, New York City uh, medical institutions to gather uh, COVID data. At the end of the, of the pandemic, we had so many data, we didn't know what to do with it, but we knew that it had to be available for people. And we realized that not everyone uh, in their institution necessarily have a restricted environment to host this sensitive data because it was identified. So what we decided to do is that we would allow people to use Data Core to get a piece of those data sets. Whenever they needed to do their study, they can have uh, the WCM credential necessary for it, and they can perfectly use Data Core. Um, right now, we have a lot of artificial intelligence related um, uh, uh, projects. For example, using Llama, uh, for example, for a, a recent project that works on automating clinical note summarization. Uh, we also have um, an interesting project that works on pediatric epilepsy, learning health uh, system. And this project is very interesting because it gathers um, data from um, um, hospi children in hospitals from multiple um, institutions across the nation. We have children hospital from Ohio, Colorado, Texas, 
um, Illinois, uh, Boston, Seattle, participating in the study, and they're all using Data Core to um, host and analyze the data set. I want to emphasize that the Data Core team is really crucial in this um, whole process because they really act as intermediary between the PI, between the external data provider, and uh, with the research team. They really handle all the administrative burden, um, so the PI can really focus on um, analyzing their data. So for example, we take care of anything that relates to IRB, or um, make sure that the data governance is, um, and the, the, the technical environment is in um, agreement. So uh, we make sure that the data, uh, the data core users access is um, in agreement with the IRB and uh, with whatever the PI wants it to be. And of course with the data provider um, as well. So really um, try to lift the burden as much as possible from the PIs. So now, uh, how does it look like when a PI connect to data core? Well, it really looks like they are connecting to their Windows machine or their Linux machine. Um, what they have in their, um, on their machine is basically one folder where they have their primary data. This is a read-only folder. They cannot touch it, just read it. So they cannot take the risk of overriding anything um, regarding source data. They also have a shared workspace where they can collaborate and use to connect, um, like to share results or analysis with their dif between different users. And then each user have their own uh, workspace environment, um, and they have read and write uh, permission as well as in the, in the shared workspace. By default, we provide SAS, RStudio, which are a statistical tool, uh, SPSS as well, and MS Office Suite, so at no charge. Um, and Data Core Creation Team really takes care of importing or exporting any file in or out from Data Core. We make sure that it's totally identi de identified when it is exported out of Data Core. And any users connecting to Data Core cannot copy paste anything out of Data Core. Um, they have to use WCM uh, central authentication to connect and, um, and our um, remote apps. And um, they are completely isolated from internet or any other network devices or any other services. Um, I want also obviously to acknowledge that it takes a village to run Data Core. Um, I, I, I just put like here, like you have in parentheses the number of people that are involved in each different team that are um, helping running Data Core. They are not like people who are dedicating 100% of their time to run Data Core. They just give a percentage of their time. Um, but the library staff is, is really, really involved and we have four uh, library librarians involved in to running Data Core. Um, talking about the Data Core curation team, here it is. Um, so um, Terry is really at the top. She oversees the whole service. And um, I come to help um, manage the, the data core along with John Ruffing, who advises on the architecture and design of the service. But really, um, Alice Chin is the one making most of the work along with her two reports, uh, Patrick Chen and Eric Lohano, who are data management specialists. Alice is a certified member. That means that she, uh, for the identification. So she ensures that anything that is uh, taking out of the data core is completely de-identified, and she's been certified for that. And obviously, we connect very um, closely with our technical team that I mentioned just before. Um, so how does it look like concretely in our daily operation? Uh, what Data Core does, the Data Core creation team takes care of anything that relates to onboarding project or offboarding project out of um, Data Core. We also make sure that any operation runs smoothly. Um, and we review um, each project um, on, a, on a regular basis to make sure that everything is up to date and current. So when we onboard somebody, um, I mean a project, sorry, uh, usually we check, of course, the data governance um, documents. We make sure that we set up the environment exactly in agreement with whatever is stated in the DOAs or the IRBs. We also check the timeline of the project with the PI. We make sure that um, they specify all their project requirements regarding RAM storage, space, software, application, whatever they need. And we make sure that um, we provide an operational environment that runs smoothly, but still in agreement with um, security regulation. If they want to make any change to their, um, their um, environment, they just uh, put, a, put in a request. So that could be for data in import or export. That could be also to change user access if they want another to add another user uh, to the project, they reach out to us. We'll make sure that this is done, and of course, 
that it is added, that the user is added also in the RRB protocols. And um, we make sure that whatever record we have of the project is up to date. And we make sure that the project is still running and that they still using the amount of resources that they're asking for. Um, and then comes the end of the project, we make sure that it's on off boarded. Uh, we close the project and when the, um, the project end comes, we make sure that the um, environment is deleted, but also we take care of the data. Um, so if it needs to be destroyed, we take care of that and we provide them a certification of destruction. Um, if the data needs to be archived, we take care of that also for them. Now there are different features and options available in Data Core. Um, I want to uh, just emphasize that we use our ticketing system that is called ServiceNow to manage all the requests that we go through, that we, we get from Data Core. And we have built our own um, web admin, admin web application to manage Data Core projects that we call Marigold. It's homegrown. And we recover for the cost for all our costs. So uh, for and we charge according to the number of users per project. Uh, the software they use, the computational power that they use, um, and researchers are trusting so much data core that they involve us as early as in the grant application process. So they, told, they usually ask us how much it's going to cost to host data core, they ask us for quotes, and we're obviously happy to provide that for them. Um, they always have the option during or at the beginning or after uh, the beginning of the project to add more memory, CPU, or more GPU if they want. Um, we can connect the database to their environment. Uh, we can increase the storage and add any licensed software that they want. Um, it is really important to note that data core environment is completely connected to our data catalog and our retention tool, so it facilitates when they reach the end of the research data life cycle, the archiving, for example, of the data and publishing and advertising it also through the institution. Um, now, I talked about a charging model. I just wanted to give you here like some figures um, so you get an idea of how much it costs to have a data core project. Um, overall, it's between $500 and $610, depending on the options that you pick. Uh, you have up to $85 charged for software, it depends which software uh, they pick. Um, the storage is between uh, $2.50 and $25 per 100 gigs. Uh, we, the most of the cost comes from hosting, so like the server, running the server. Um, we offer by um, the baseline is 32 CPU and 128 gigabyte of RAM. And we charge also uh, for staffing costs $250 per user. So right now, in terms of status, uh, we have been uh, certified by the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services for our on-premise environment and also for our AWS cloud environment. We are working on cloud initiatives. So we already have an AWS environment that people can use um, to uh, analyze their data set. We provide Windows, Linux operating system, as well as GPU, depending on the, well, on demand. Um, and right now we are working on also offering Azure uh, to our researchers. We are still in testing phase and we're also working on getting our Azure environment CMS certified so we can host sensitive data set. We also have some package repository available for researchers, so even though it's disconnected from internet, they can directly install their R packages themselves with our, depending on the admin team. And we are working on a Python repository. Uh, the CRAN repository for R packages is already available. And I'm gonna finish with this slide actually uh, about the, diff like the challenges and the successes that we've been encountering when we set up Data Core. So of course Data Core is set up to reflect the current regulations, but also uh, the current computational demand with are like very, oops, very moving targets. So like it, it is, it has been a little bit challenging to always keep up uh, with um, whatever researchers ask us in terms of um, computational power, and also um, in agree to be in agreement with the latest regulations. And every time th those two things changes, we have to train them. We have to train also ourselves to use new resources or new tools. So sometimes it is a bit challenging to keep people engaged uh, because when they have to change their habits every now and then. Um, it, it can be discouraging for some of them. We try to facilitate that as much as possible and to make it as seamless as possible. And of course, there is a cost to build um, such services. It is not impossible, but there is some level of investment on the staff and uh, a little bit on the financial part too. But we really, I think, have been successful in those services because 
um, our library and our information and technology services are very, very close. We report actually, we're part of the same department and we both report to our CIO, our Chief Information Officer, which really facilitates um, the work that we've been doing. We have very motivated staff, especially at the library, and the leadership is very, very supportive of our initiatives. Um, and we get a lot of help from our researchers, um, feedback on the new services, and what is working, what is not working. Um, and so with that, I think I'm gonna um, finish here, and I'm happy to take any question. Hey, uh, John Pettis from Virginia Tech. This is really cool. I wish we had something like this at Virginia Tech. That would be great. Thank you. Um, I was curious, like, what kind of questions you're asking on your onboarding form. So I was just looking on your line. Like, uh, are you asking for a detailed data management plans uh, in that form, or are you asking more about like what quotas do you need? Are you are you what 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 level of content are you asking for before people get accounts and start working for? Yeah, so. that's a great question. Thanks for asking this. Um, so, one of the first questions we asked because. So on campus, we have our data core, but we also have another cluster that is dedicated for non-sensitive data. So obviously for researchers, it's very tempting to go directly to this cluster that they're very familiar with um, to analyze their sensitive data, except that it's not compliant with the regulations. So the first thing that uh, we have in the form, and it is common between both our cluster, like non-sensitive data cluster and our data core, is to have a form that asks them the type of data they are dealing with um, and the amount of resources that they need, RAM, storage, applications, and so on, and the, light, the, the time that their project is expected to, to last as well. Um, and depending on this like first um, triage form, we orient them, I mean, somebody orient them towards the non-sensitive data cluster or to, towards the data core. And usually they follow the path pretty, um, you know, diligently. And so um, um, when we, they get to us at this point at the data core, we ask them very technical questions. So the first thing actually we ask them is to provide us any data use agreement or any IRB protocol. That's the very first thing. And then our data creation team read those documents very carefully, try to understand all the requirements, the restrictions that are needed to host these data sets, and then um, engage with discussion with, with the, in a discussion with the researchers to make sure that uh, whatever they expect from their environment is um, is okay with regulation, whatever is stated in the um, data governance documents. And of course, we talk about technical aspects, so, such as, for example, we had um, a recent researcher who was really fond of ChatGPT, um, as a lot of researchers are now, uh, but who wanted to apply this kind of large language model to you know, facilitate um, the reading of um, notes that are taken by physician or to facilitate cohort selection. So like, you know, finding very easily um, the right candidates for their study. And they were very excited by using ChatGPT. For that, we told them, absolutely not. Please do not do that. Um, and so there is some education involved in that. Um, and But um, we managed to do that very easily because um, data core users are trusting data core to really uh, facilitate their work, reduce their admin burden, um, and taking care of anything that relates to security. So we really try to have them focus on what they need to do um, and be aware of what they shouldn't be doing um, and guide them through, through the whole process. So um, I hope that answers the question. Any other question? Hi, this is very interesting. Um, at our, interest, uh, at our university, we're, we're navigating a lot of different regulated research uh, you know, needs of our community. And I'm wondering from what you've learned here, um, how extendable is this type of approach to other um, security requirements like NIST 800-171? Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting yeah. question. Um, so actually, there's two ways to answer that. But well, first of all, I think, like building something like data core is definitely like reachable. You guys can do it. Um, you just need to have the, it's really a teamwork. You just need to have the right people involved, not 100% on it, 
but you know, just spending like the necessary amount of time so you get the technical skills that you need um, um, to run things smoothly, especially on the security side. Um, now, because we have worked quite hard on getting the CMS certifications, that helps once you have one certification that you know uh, paved the way for a lot of other certifications. So it requires a lot of work on the technical side, like meaning like reporting exactly about all the measures that you're taking to maintain your data safe. Uh, but once you have that, you can expand very easily to other type of certification that are needed to host other type of data sets. So it's really worth the investment. It's a lot of work. I'm not hiding it. We've been spending, um, I think, a full year, a full year and a half on the CMS certification for the cloud, or even though we we had already like a, you know, it's it was a very mature service and we knew what we were doing for a while, but it still requires a lot of time. It is worth um, the investment though, um, because it really facilitated a lot of all the rest of the work that you'll be, you, you'll be doing. I don't know if that answers your question, I hope so. Um, but let me know if, yeah. 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 Exactly. I wanted to go back to this um, this slide because I mean that shows the amount of technical skills that are needed to um, run Data Core. But it is really important also to have. I I think like no one should hesitate to involve librarians in this kind of endeavor because they are very good at organizing data, administering things, running things, managing teams. They are used to working in in team, in teams, and I think that um, that's also like a a big win, I think, um, in running those kind of environment and removing a lot of admin burden from both researchers and technical team as well, because they don't have to do all the back and forth. We take care of that. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, well, almost at time, so there's no more question. Um, Terry is there to answer any question. Don't forget, um, and I'm happy to chat over a break if you need. Thanks very much. <laughs>